Hi and welcome to this Post Social Podcast. Today we talk to Chris Day, FA Talent Consultant and Parasport Technical Coach. We discuss his work in and around the world of disability sport and also talking about his previous work experience as a coach in football and futsal. Before we start, please make sure to subscribe to our channel and check the description for our Twitter, Facebook and LinkedIn pages. Okay, thank you very much, Chris, for being here today. How are you? You're welcome. Yeah, thanks, Oliver. All good. Thanks for inviting me on. No worries. No worries at all. Uh, so before we get into the questions, uh, could you just perhaps give us a big brief summary of like, your work, what your interests are and whatnot? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So um, uh, I have a couple of roles. Uh, one of the roles is I work for the National FA in talent development, talent ID and player development on the para side. So uh, the disability England teams um, and my second role is I'm head of football at a college in Hayward Teeth, which is in Mid-Sussex. So responsible for overseeing uh, the programme and players development and fixtures and things like that. So um, a lot of juggling as, as with a lot of people in football. Um, yeah. yeah, interest interest would be <laughs> pretty much outside outside of football family and stuff. But yeah, it's, it's talent right. identification right. and development of players particularly is my specialist area. Right, so uh, as with... As talent, uh, as a talent specialist with um, disability, with football, as that side. Uh, so, what do you? So, with the job, what do you look for? Is it you have to be told what you look for in people, or do you see someone and think, okay, yeah, in my in my eyes, uh, I pick you, kind of thing. I don't know if I've used the right words there. No, 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 so no, no. No, no, that's good. Yeah, I mean, yeah, with, within any talent ID area, it's it's always subjective. Um, mm. You know, there's what we say is there's shouting talent and there's whispering talent. Um, example of shouting talent within mainstream football would be someone like Messi. It's quite obvious from yeah. seven or eight yeah. when you watch those videos, Ronaldinho, those early shouting talent, that those players have probably got a pathway into elite sport. Whispering talent can be the late developers um, and they're much harder to spot. Um, in the area that I work with on the para side, a lot of the talent is whispering. So it might not be obvious to people that there's a pathway for that player. Um, so the main criteria really is around the sort of eligibility and classification and the potential of the player. So there are certain barriers to entry within para sport because it's guideline by European and international classification. So there's certain elements, certain areas of deafness that we work with. There's certain areas of sight that we work with and outside of those parameters, those players might not classify. So there's outside factors other than potential and, and obvious talent as well, which um, is quite deep. I won't get into too much now, but there's a, there's a lot that we, we look for outside of mainstream kind of type talent identification. Right. So um, how long have you been at this job? Uh, I've worked for the FA for six years, I think it is. So, um, yeah, six years kind of like um, working across various um, departments in a year, working on the women's talent ID, mainstream women's talent ID as well, but um, specialising in the para side now. So worked all the way up the pathway um, up to working with one of the senior teams at the moment. But um, I run one of the performance teams as well, which is like a under 21s and I've done a couple. So I've done the deaf under 21s and the partially sighted under 21s. So very much around kind of adding the final bits to players, if that makes sense. So the final kind of like the cherry on top almost, so the players getting towards the pathway, but what do they need to get into a senior team? And that jump, the same in mainstream football, 23s to senior football can yeah. be the biggest jump yeah. and the hardest jump to make. Um, it's, it's it's not an not an obvious thing. So sometimes it's around the sort of site corner works. We work with the psychologists, sometimes it's sports scientists, sometimes it's about luck and timing but often you know with elite players we find that the you know that the resilience and things like that always have to be in place by the time they get to kind of under 21s level with us certainly so we work along that on the pathway with them right so you uh so you've mentioned that you've worked with the deaf uh side of uh, yeah para sport and also parsley side are those yeah. your two main areas or is that um, yeah, no, I, I work. Yeah, work with CP, so cerebral palsy players as well um, right, on yeah. the pathway. So there, there, there are kind of three main what we call ambulance. So like the running versions of the game. So we also have um, specialist teams for power chair, which is like a four v four indoor format that you might have seen. We, I don't work on that, but we have that as an England team, the blind team as well. But I've worked with some of the development players as well, which is almost like a futsal type outdoor version of the game with boards and the 
the you know the, the ball that you've probably seen which is a Paralympic sport as well so yeah I mean I've worked across pretty much every area but I tend to specialize more on kind of like the deaf and the partially sighted and CP which is the main three elements of our pathway on the ambulant version at the moment right so uh with this job did it was it always something in mind uh let's say like before going into anything sport related in your career was it always something in the back of your mind with talent ID uh, no, not really. I think the um, same as a lot of coaches, I've kind of um, I found where I work. I'm a futsal specialist as well. Um, mm. So I coach futsal in, in my college job pretty much every day and outside of it as well. So futsal is something I've been massively passionate about. And that maybe linked me into the kind of para side because the partially sighted version of the game is futsal. So it's 5v5. It's, it's pretty much the same format. The keepers can't leave the D. That's the only change the other version of the game is exactly the same as you would see with mainstream futsal so futsal is something that's probably lured me into those areas but i've worked within mainstream as well i've worked in the girls um, academy at brighton up to under 16s run uh, cpd events free triple p boys clubs as well around futsal so um, i've always been interested in kind of talent id and player development but the difference is on the para side we probably a bit more involved in the player's journey if that makes sense so yeah. certainly yeah. on, on uh, boys academies you know uh, it's changing a little bit now but um, you know the coaches will have the players for a year maybe under eights under nines and then pass them on and then another group comes in and they're a little part of the journey but you know there's a lot going on but um, for myself maybe it's a little bit selfish but I like to be a bit more involved in the players journey so I've got a couple of players in the partially sighted they're just going to the seniors at the moment and I've had them since they're 11 I've coached them at every step of their journey um, which has been great to see you know alongside lots of other people you know, there's a lot of um, input into making elite players, but it's been nice to have that impact and then that support for the player when they go in. And, you know, the same with lots of other players coming forward through the pathway as well. So <clears throat> it wasn't something that I saw myself doing at any point, but I think it's probably something that I'm, I'm quite good at, um, that, you know, that I've got the tools for patience and player development over a longer term. I'm not looking for that shout and talent all the time. I'm looking for that player that might have been missed by mainstream football sometimes. Right. Um, so you mentioned <clears throat> futsal as well. It's yeah. Part of your career. So um, when, when did you first get into futsal? Um, good, good question. Probably about 10 years ago. So I've been coaching for about 18 years and I, I first saw it like I think a lot of people through. I think it was Simon Clifford's Brazilian soccer schools. I think that's right, which produced some early players. It was a slightly different format of the game to what we see now, but I found it quite fascinating and I think around the same time, I also, alongside all this coaching that I do, I also run my son's team and another team at the same age. So I oversee two under-15 teams and uh, my son's team, they've done futsal since they were six. So they're into their eighth year now of playing futsal. Um, and we use it as a tool with them for football development, although they absolutely love the game in its own right. But yeah, probably saw it about 10 years ago and I, I saw how beneficial it was in terms of kind of like a conditioned game. It really does give you a lot as a, a coach and a player in terms of instant feedback around what that player needs, around what the players can see, what they need around kind of moving the ball quickly. It's, you know, if you, if you watch futsal, I'm sure you have, or if anyone watches it, it's essentially basketball. It's a transitional game, you yeah. know, that if you, if you lose possession, you've got to, you've got to react there. quickly. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, there's... I get that. And, and I get that from my coach, so... <laughs> Do you? Uh, yeah, yeah I, this, I, hope you I hope you don't listen to this, but um, um, yeah, I'm sorry, sure it doesn't grill me a bit. Well, it's um, so. it, it what what we say is there's nowhere to hide on the court. And that's the same at basketball. My son's a very keen basketball player as well. So he plays basketball, futsal and football. And there is a real, there's a key link between the three and the way that he plays football from the basketball and the futsal. But there's nowhere to hide. You know, if, if you're the keepers out of the game, once they've played the ball out, it's four. It's that four players rotating and trying to find little elements of space. Mm. You know, you can't be the person, oh, I'm going to pl go play out front. That's five aside. Nothing wrong with five aside, but it's a very different version of the sport. It's everyone's involved in the build up, the transition, the breakdown. You know, if you beat a player 1v1, the chances are you've got a temporary overload. So you have to make use of it very quickly. So you've got a 2v1, sometimes a 3v2. Those moments of the game, they happen in football as well. So can we recognize that transitional moment? You know, we co coaches talk about that four seconds on the transition in futsal. It's probably half a second if that. So you've got to make a quick decision in half a second. If you start dribbling, you're probably slowing it down potentially 
You know, if you've been a player, the, the next ball is probably a shot or a forward pass to someone who can shoot. So we're always trying to use the, the idea of think forwards, play forwards, move forwards. So you're always forwards thinking. And then when it breaks down, you've got to stop that. The opposite is stop them doing that. Um, and from a psych corner point of view and physical point of view, the returns for foot are enormous, particularly psych. I think it's something that's overlooked. Yeah, I think um, Mike Scubala, who was the England coach, he talked about being a pressure cooker environment. And I think that kind of sums it up that you might be on the court at elite level for four minutes. And certainly with the partials, we play four minutes on, four minutes off. And that four minutes off is a real time to focus, watch what's going on, get your thoughts. If you do eight minutes, which is quite rare at elite foot, futsal, slightly different at grassroots and participation, but at elite level, that four minutes you're on has to be at high tempo and your mental processing speed and your reaction to mistakes. You know, you cannot focus on mistakes. You have to think about them afterwards. If you focus on a mistake during the game of futsal, you are dead in the water. And, and that's the same in any kind of like transitional sport and invasion game like futsal. And I think the returns for football, particularly around that, again, reacting to mistakes, you'll see less of them because the area is bigger. But again, if you can get that positive reaction to a mistake in football from futsal, you'll be able to deal with it with both versions of the game very well. And it's a great sport in its own right. I absolutely love futsal. I played it myself until yeah. I did my cruciate. And, you know, again, the, the learning that it gives you around having to use both feet, having to receive tight areas, having to receive safe side, which is different to football, where we're looking for that back foot pass is all very, very different and, you know, can, can add elements of, of the game. Yeah, 100% agree with you. I've only just got into it myself this year. So, uh, yeah, I agree with you. It's a, it's a great game. Uh, you also worked as, at Brighton, uh, Brighton Football Club, as a yep. futsal coach. Could you talk yep. a bit more into that? So, what was the kind of yeah, well, actually, you got uh, out of it? Yeah, no, um, I was at Brighton for seven years. So, I worked across uh, various elements of the community and in the Girls Academy as well. Um, uh, actually taught me a lot, uh, a lot about myself as a coach, a lot about how to deliver. I mean, I did some homeless football sessions, which I'm still in touch with some of the young people that I work with um, from that time, um, keep in touch with them and see how their lives are going. And in terms of probably impact as a coach, I would say they're probably on me, you know, the biggest areas around learning of how to deal with players with complex needs in sessions. Someone might be turning up and you're really having to dig into how can you help them? What can be the benefit of that session? And in terms of what you're asking around kind of like, social returns that you know the idea is that what we're producing whatever level of player we work with we're producing good citizens good people that's the only outcome yes we're trying to give them the technical aspects to become elite players but at the end of the day the real success is can you give them some value driven elements of the program as well so that was we did walking football um we did open kind of access female versions of the game as well did the foot sale program which is post education so players who were leaving, um, you know, school year 11 and then coming on to us for a couple of years and teaching a version of the sport to go on to university, and which is similar to what I do at Hayward Teeth now as well. But, yeah, really enjoyable time there and, and certainly learned a lot and some great colleagues as well. Right, yeah. So you mentioned uh, Hayward Teeth College. Uh, you're the lead academy football coach there. Yep. So by that, I'm guessing uh, within youth football, you're... Uh, the main coach so what what kind of uh like responsibilities do you have there uh yeah i'm basically head of the football program so i i set up the program when i left brighton um i went to hayward's eve to set up something similar in terms of post-education delivery so um right. it's a it's a essentially a sixth form college they were looking for someone to come in and set up a football program to run alongside the academic things so we take a level students btech sports students as well, um, able to work with them. So we set up a football academy and the players come to us three days a week. So two two sessions plus one game. Um, we decided to introduce futsal as part of that as well. And I would say 99.9% .9 of the players have never played futsal. Some of them have done one tournament a year, um, but that's it. So again, in terms of kind of like ability to accelerate development for football as well, we've got some of the players now who actually only want to do futsal, which is fantastic. So we've had games against Chelsea Futsal, played some Futsal festivals. And in terms of their learning, then again, transferring to football, which is what we were mainly using it for is great. But actually, a lot of them have seen it as now, oh, I actually really like this sport. So again, using Futsal as a tool for development, but as a sport on its own right. So um, 
day-to-day jobs so organizing teams for fixtures organizing fixtures against colleges we've literally this week just won the league so unbeaten in our first year which has been incredible um real real success story and again off the mm, back of it yeah. very much value-driven program so we're looking at apprentices from the current players mm, to stay yeah. on board with us and i'm sure you know the term cultural architects around people who can stay in a program and kind of help keep that value driven um, throughout the program so we're looking for players to keep you know come on board as coaches we've got two or three people in mind for next year so again expanding the program so there's coaching opportunities some are going off to America to play um, some of them are playing Isthmian football now where they weren't before so individualizing we've got one of the partially sighted players from England's on the program on a specialist futsal course with us so individualizing what their needs will be alongside their academic delivery as well so we call it sort of student athlete so we need to keep on top of that educational bit as well uh, that needs to be in place for them mm-hmm. to do the football academy but yeah so organizing and delivery so myself and another coach who was at brighton as well oversee all of that for the college and and you know really enjoy doing that it's great because the the returns that you get again from that social bit with the players and from a coaching point of view i'm i'm i am a coach um i realized that some years ago you know some people like doing a little bit of coaching and dropping in and out but i really really think that being able to coach is a strength that you need to constantly practice. We talk about players practicing, but if you're a coach, you need to be practicing and getting things wrong. So experimenting with types of delivery, types of session. And the only way you can do that is hours on the court or the grass. Um, I see a lot of people slip into kind of like fairly easy roles, you know, doing lots of meetings and stuff within football. That's not really who I am. So I have to do a little bit of that. (laughs) Don't get me wrong, but you know, my, my strength is coaching and it's something that I'm really keen to carry on developing. You know, I, I still feel that I'm very much at early days within my journey and where that might, may go. I'm not too sure, but you know, all these kind of different elements and the bits I did at Brighton, you know, have all contributed to it. The bits I'm doing at Hayward Heath, the bits that I do with England, the bits I did on the girls program, you know, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. You're always adding little pieces, you know, and you still don't know what the main picture will look like at the end. Right. Well, um, yeah, that's all. That's all I have for you today. Uh, thank you very much for giving no me your time for today. No problem at all. Uh, it's Great been to very, see you. Yeah, it's been good to get your experience out within uh, your role now with the FA, also as a coach within football and futsal. Uh, so, yeah, Love just it. thank you. Thank you very much. For today. No worries. Thanks for your time. No worries. Thanks. Great to meet you. Cheers.